another Hendrix High Yield Pediatric Topics. Today we're going to be talking about upper respiratory tract infections and I'm going to try to go through them pretty quickly. We're going to start with the common cold. The common cold typically, typically starts with a dry scratchy throat, then you develop a pretty runny nose. About 30% of the time you can have a cough, you may have some fever. The common cold is caused by viruses most typically rhinovirus, coronavirus, so I always picture that rhinoceros with a corona in its mouth and a big drippy runny nose who has a cold. Um, those are the two most common causes. Of course we see it with parainfluenza virus, influenza viruses, as well as RSV. Um, those, each one of those different viruses may have a seasonality to it, so they may happen more often in the fall or in the winter, um, sometimes even in the early spring, depending on which virus you're looking at. Because there's viruses, we don't do much to treat them. We just do offer supportive care. Remember, cough and cold medications are not safe for children under six years of age. That's because the cough and cold medications may be too sedating for young children. So they're not effective, they're not helping them, and they may sedate them too dangerously. So we don't offer any cough and cold medications to kids under six years of age. Something you can offer them is honey. Um, you definitely never want to give honey to a child less than one year of age because we're worried about the spores which could create infantile botulism. So we never give honey less than one year of age. But if the child is older than one year of age, you can give them some honey, maybe even with a little bit of um, lemon to help increase their vitamin C intake, and then lots and lots of fluids and rest. Typical viruses are going to last anywhere from 7 to 10 days, so you definitely want to manage the parent's expectations that it could last as long as 10 days. And it's not uncommon for especially young kids who are in the early school ages to have colds frequently. So up to 10 times a year, just 10 different viruses, um, which if they're lasting up to 10 days, your child could be sick for 100 days out of the year. And as long as they're not very sick, meaning there isn't a bacterial infection, they don't need antibiotics, they're not requiring hospitalization, then we just chalk it up to normal childhood. And usually the incidence number of colds that we have um, decreases as time goes on, as the child gets older. Then we're going to move on to croup. Croup is laryngotracheobronchitis. So it's inflammation of the larynx of the trachea and of the bronchioles, so inflammation of those large airways. Um, the classic findings of croup is a dry barking cough, and parents will literally say, my child sounds like they're barking, arf, 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 barking like a seal. Um, so that dry barking cough, we instantly think croup, and they may have strider. Strider is a respiratory sound that you can hear without a stethoscope. It's a high-pitched sound. Sounds a little bit like <coughs> You imagine a child's airway is so inflamed and so narrowed, you're hearing the turbulent airflow going through that very narrowed airway. So it's not dissimilar from wheezing. Wheezing, we typically hear expiratory, but you can hear some inspiratory wheezes. And wheezing is more a narrowing of the smaller airways, um, whereas strider is a much higher pitched, often louder sound than wheezing. Um, and it's due to the larger airways um, starting to close off. Strider is always something that you need to examine. Strider at rest, meaning the child is just sitting there comfortably um, and they are stridulous with every breath they take. <coughs> That's a child you instantly want to examine and make sure that their airway is secure and they're not at risk for that already narrowed airway to completely shut off. Um, it's more common for kids that have croup to have strider when they're actively coughing or they're actively breathing quickly and then the strider resolves as they calm down. Uh, the most common causes of croup are, we use the mnemonic PMR. PMR is an acronym, um, and it stands for, the reason we use that mnemonic is we used to think that with croup that you could um, help the patient by taking them into the cool night air, that cool mist can help to decrease some of the inflammation in those large airways. Um, that hasn't actually been scientifically proven. There's no studies that show that cool mist helps with croup, um, but it is something that was done often in the olden days. Um, so PMR, P stands for parainfluenza virus. Parainfluenza virus is the most common cause of croup. Um, so that's the P. M stands for measles or metanumovirus. A stands for adenovirus. I stands for influenza. And R stands for RSV. 
Um, so those are the most common causes of croup. The big one to know for the boards and any exams you're going to be taking is parainfluenza virus. Um, croup, you can usually diagnose it clinically. The child comes in, they have that classic presentation of that dry barking cough. It's usually a pretty insidious onset, so meaning it slowly starts to happen. They start with a little con nasal congestion, they're feeling just a little bit down for a couple of days, and then they start with that dry barking cough, cough maybe with a little bit of strider. Um, the treatment for croup, if the strider is severe, if that inflammation and that narrowing in the airway is severe, then we can give systemic corticosteroids. In the emergency department, you can give racemic epinephrine um, to help directly impact the inflammation in the airways. Um, if they're hypoxic, clearly you want to give them oxygen. Less than 1% of the time do patients with croup actually need intubation in order to secure their airways. Usually it's a more mild phenomenon. Um, so if the history is not very clear-cut that it's croup, then you may get an x-ray. So if you want to rule out a foreign body, right, so if somebody, if you're worried that somebody aspirated a foreign body, that could certainly block off their airway, giving you that turbulent airflow and that stridulous sound. The classic x-ray finding for croup, we do a PA film, and the classic x-ray finding is the steeple sign. So here is that image of the steeple sign. You see that narrowing of the airway up there. So croup caused by parainfluenza virus, dry barking cough, steeple sign. Um, we're going to directly contrast croup to epiglottitis. Um, with croup, you need to move to intubation less than 1% of the time in order to protect the airway. That is directly in contrast to epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is infection and inflammation of the epiglottis. It is a true medical emergency. If that epiglottis gets too inflamed, that airway can close off very, very quickly. Patients with epiglottitis also present with strider. Instead of that slow, insidious onset that we see with croup, epiglottitis comes on very rapidly. It is a quick, rapid onset. Um, patients with epiglottitis typically are trying to maintain their own airway, so they'll sit in a tripod posture, um, so putting their hands on their legs, leaning their chin and neck forward, trying to open up their airway, a tripod posture. They may speak with a hot potato voice, so sound like they took a bite of a hot potato and they're speaking in that muffled type of a voice. They may have pooling of their secretions and drooling because they can't swallow their saliva past that inflamed epiglottis. Like I said, it happens very rapidly. Within hours, the child goes from looking okay to suddenly being very, very sick. It's a true medical emergency. You certainly do not want to try to examine a patient who you suspect has epiglottitis um, in any setting outside of an area where you know you can quickly and safely intubate them. So make sure they're in the ER, in the ICU, in the OR, somewhere where you can protect that airway as quickly as you need to because they can decompensate quickly. To show you an image of what that inflamed epiglottis looks like, on this side we see a normal healthy epiglottis, on this one we see um, an inflamed epiglottis with epiglottitis. You can see the airway is almost completely closed and luckily this patient is intubated. You can see the tube um, going past the epiglottis. For epiglottitis, it's a true medical emergency. Um, the most common etiology used to be haemophilus influenza type B. Um, we have a vaccine for that, so we see fewer and fewer cases of epiglottitis nowadays, thankfully. Um, although some strep pneumo has certainly crept in to be an etiology of epiglottitis, especially the resistant strep pneumos. So if we suspect that a patient has epiglottitis, first and foremost, we secure their airway in as safe a way as possible, and then we're gonna start empiric antibiotics. So usually with a cephalosporin um, and an antibiotic that's going to be effective against those resistant streps. Um, if you want to get an x-ray and you wouldn't get an x-ray until the patient's airway was secured and you knew that they were safe, um, the classic x-ray for epiglottitis, we usually do a lateral neck film. So remember with croup, we were doing a PA chest film. Uh, this time we're doing a lateral neck film to look at the epiglottis. And we can see the epiglottis here. It looks like a thumbprint. It is very thick instead of being that nice narrow epiglottis that we would expect in a healthy individual. So this is the thumbprint sign. So epiglottitis, homophilus influenza type B, strep pneumo are the etiologies. It's a medical emergency. They have drooling, dysphagia, um, and they're in distress. Those are the three Ds of epiglottitis. You're going to secure their airway. You're going to give them um, empiric antibiotics, and we see the thumbprint sign on x-ray. Now we're going to move on to strep throat. 
strep throat is caused by group A um, beta hemolytic strep. Strep throat um, is pretty classically presents just with a very, very, very sore throat, so it hurts to swallow. It's incredibly painful. They can often have fever as well. They often have cervical lymphadenopathy, but not a lot of other symptoms. They don't really have cough. They don't have conjunctivitis. They don't have other symptoms. If somebody has a very sore throat, if they have pharyngitis with other symptoms like cough or conjunctivitis, then you think that it's probably a viral etiology. Um, for group A beta hemolytic strep, um, we definitely want to treat that with antibiotics, not because we're worried about any of the um, dangers of having strep throat. Strep throat will actually heal on its own within um, a matter of a few days. The body is self-healing. However, we want to try to prevent against um, acute rheumatic fever. That's the main reason why we're trying to treat, we're trying to um, diagnose and treat strep throat as quickly as we can to prevent the um, rheumatic fever. There are other sequelae of strep throat of that group A beta hemolytic strep infection, um, things like post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Unfortunately, early treatment um, for strep throat doesn't really prevent the patient from developing post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Um, and often it's other causes of strep that is more, more common as a cause of that. Um, we have the center criteria, which help us to distinguish if we think that a pharyngitis is more likely bacterial versus viral. The center criteria are four criteria, and I have a picture here from one of my slides. I don't know how clearly you can read that. Um, so it's fever. Fever is a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius or higher. Cervical lymphadenopathy, tonsillar swelling or exudates, and then the absence of a cough. Those are the four center criteria. Um, the way that we score central criteria, we can use the modified where we add a point if the child is younger than 15 years of age, we subtract a point if the patient is greater than 44 years of age, and then if they um, have four or five points, they have greater than a 50% chance of having a bacterial cause of their pharyngitis, um, which most likely is that group A beta hemolytic strep, and so we go ahead and treat them. We usually treat them with amoxicillin. Um, pen any penicillin, we use amoxicillin in pediatrics because it's so readily available and tastes good. It's pretty well tolerated by our patients. Um, for the physical exam findings of strep throat, we usually see that very beefy red, beefy erythematous posterior oropharynx. We see tonsillar um, edema as well as tonsillar um, exudates. You can see petechiae on the palates, pinpoint macules because they're flat. Um, so little tiny flat macules that are erythematous, um, palatal petechiae, as well as cervical lymphadenopathy. Those are the classic findings for um, strep pharyngitis. I hope that this was helpful. Please give me feedback. I'd love to know if you guys are out there watching and if you're appreciating these. Thank you so much. Have a great day.